This lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about associative primes of a module M. So um, the set of associated primes of M is a set noted by S of M. And um, it's a collection of primes that sort of control where the module is geometrically, as we will see next lecture. So as motivation, let's look at the case for modules M of finite length. So um, if a module is finite length, then we can write naught equals M naught contained in M1 contained in M2 and so on, contained in Mn equals M, with each quotient Mi plus one over Mi, um, um, a simple module. This means it has no submodules other than a zero or itself, and is therefore isomorphic to something of the form R modulo, a maximal ideal. Um, well, that's fine for modules of finite length, but the trouble is most modules we want to deal with are not of finite length, and most of them tend to be finitely generated. So can we do, so can we find an analog for finitely generated modules? Well, um, over arbitrary rings, uh, we can't really do an awful lot. Um, so what we're going to do is assume that R is notarian. Um, and you remember that finitely generated modules over a notarian ring are also notarian. So in particular, um, the module M will be notarian. So um, let's start by looking at some examples just to see what's going on. Let's take our ring to be the integers z. Then modules are just finitely generated abelian groups. And we know what a finitely generated abelian group looks like. It can be written as a sum of um, copies of z plus a sum over or p of a sum over various values n i of z over <coughs> p to the n i of z. It's just a sum of um, cyclic groups of various orders. And we can build this out of the following modules. First of all, we have the modules, the simple module z over p z, um, which is z over the prime p. So these are the simple ones. But we can't build z over simple modules, so we should also um, add the module um, z which is um, just equal to z modulo the ideal zero. So um, what's going on here? Well, if we look at this, we see that these ideals here are, um, well, these ones here are maximal, but this one here is prime. So um, really we're just getting prime ideals in the denominator. So this suggests the following question. Um, can we break up <clears throat> M finitely generated over a notarian ring into modules of the form R over P for P a prime ideal. In other words, we want to find a sequence naught, which is M naught contained in M1 contained in Mn equals M with Mi plus one over Mi isomorphic to R over PI for some prime ideal PI. Um, well, uh, the answer is yes, we can. So, well, um, if the module is zero, we obviously don't have any, anything to do. So let's assume the module M is non-zero. And we first show M has a submodule isomorphic to R modulo P for P prime. Um, and for this, what we do is we pick an ideal P 
um, in R, which is maximal among the ideals so that such that R over P is isomorphic to a submodule of M. And as usual, I'll just be a bit sloppy with notation and pretend that R over P is a submodule of M. Now, if R over P is a submodule of M, um, this is the same as saying P is the annihilator of some element A in M. So we're looking for an ideal that's maximal among the set of annihilators. Of course, this doesn't mean P is a maximal ideal of the ring, it just means it's maximal among this set of ideals. And we show that P is prime. So you remember I mentioned before that if you've got a, a randomly chosen collection of ideals, the maximal elements of that set have a really strong tendency to be prime ideals. Well, if P is not, we can find um, X, Y not in P, such that X, Y is in P, and we will get a contradiction from this. Well, let's look at the image x bar of x in, in m. So you remember we've got r over p, which we're pretending is a subset of m, and x is in here, and x bar is going to be its image there. And let's look at the annihilator of x bar. So this is an ideal of r. And let's think, it contains, well, it contains the ideal P, rather obviously, and it also contains the element Y. And it contains the element Y because XY is in P. Um, so is strictly bigger than the ideal P, and it's strictly bigger than the ideal B, B because Y is not in P by assumption. Um, and it's not the ideal R, and it's not the ideal R because X is not in P, which means X bar is not equal to zero. So we've used the three conditions, X, Y is in P, Y is not in P, and X is not in P. Um, so um, this contradicts the choice of P, because we assume that P was a maximum element of the set of ideals that annihilated something in M, but here we found a bigger ideal that annihilates something in M. So. Um, We've got this contradiction by assuming that P is not prime, so P must actually be prime. So now that we've showed that M contains a submodule of the form R over P, we can very easily show that, um, that M can be split off into some such submodules. So we start with M, and if it's zero, we just stop, and if it's not zero, then we can find a module M1 such that M1 um, it's a subset of M, and M1 is isomorphic to R over P1 with P1 prime. So we, we can carry out the first step. Now we've got to find a module M2. How do we do this? Well, we look at the module M modulo M1 and apply the previous results to this. So it contains something of the form R modulo P2 as a submodule. And now we just take the inverse image of R over P2 and take M2 to be, its, to, to, to be this inverse image. It's the inverse image of R over P2, where we have M goes to M over M1, and this contains R over P2. And then we see that M2 over M1 
is then isomorphic to R over P2. And now we can con continue doing M3 and M4 in the same way. And this must eventually stop. And it stops because M is notarian. So if we've got an increasing sequence of ideals of submodules like this, it can't go on forever. Um, well, so that's all very well. Um, but uh, there's a little problem that comes up. So we can ask how often does the module R over P occur in M. So we might call this the multiplicity of R over P in M. And for M is at finite length. We saw last lecture, the multiplicity is the number of times R over P occurs in any uh, maximal chain. And more importantly, it's additive. So if we've got the sequence of finite length modules, what goes to A goes to B goes to C goes to zero, we know that the multipli we saw the multiplicity of R over P in A plus the multiplicity of R over P in B is equal to the multiplicity of R over P, uh, that should be a C, I guess, R over C in B. Um, so um, what happens if we try doing this for finitely generated modules? Well, let's take a look at a module M being say Z plus Z over two Z over the integers say. And then the multiplicity of Z over naught in M, well, that's how many times does Z occur in M? Well, that's obviously one. And how many times does Z over two Z occur in M? Well, that's pretty obvious. We can just see Z over two Z just occurs once. So that multiplicity is one, okay. Well, maybe not. There's a little problem with this, which we will see in the next um, in the next piece of paper. The problem is the following. We look at the universal counterexample to everything, which is naught goes to z, goes to z, goes to z over two z goes to naught. Now let's look at what is the multiplicity of z over 2z in this. Well, it doesn't occur there, it doesn't occur there, and it occurs once there. So it's not additive. So something has gone wrong. Um, and the problem is that, you know, we were saying z over 2z doesn't occur in z. Well, in some sense it does, because it occurs in this as a quotient. So, so this claim that the multiplicity of z over 2z and m is 1 is really dubious because z over 2z occurs in z. And there's really no limit on how often it occurs in z because, you know, if it occurs in here once, well, the kernel of the map is z and then we could pick out another factor of z over 2z in here. And so, so z over 2z really seems to occur an infinite number of times in z and this really rather messes everything up. Well, there are cases when the multiplicity is defined. For instance, if we want to know the multiplicity of z over zero in M, this is, sorry, in M, this is well defined. Because we can just define it to be the dimension over the rationals of the vector space M tensor with Q. And if M is equal to z to the N plus some finite group, m tensored with q is just equal to q to the n plus, well, we've killed off the finite bit, we just get zero. And the dimension is just n. And this is 
called the, this is just of course the rank of a of the finitely generated group and it's additive and behaves really well and so on and you may think to yourself well if we define the multiplicity of z and m like this why don't we define the multiplicity of z modulo 2z and m like this so we could just define the multiplicity to be the dimension of the field with two elements of m tensor with z over 2z. So what's wrong with this as a definition of the multiplicity? Well, the problem is it's not additive. Well, that seems a bit odd because the um, additivity of the dimension, that the dimension of a vector space is certainly additive. The problem is when we turn this into vector spaces over the field with two elements, we run into the problem that tensoring with z over 2z does not preserve exactness. As we've seen about 15 gazillion times in previous lectures. So um, we really run into a problem of trying to define the multiplicity of z modulo 2z in, an, in, in, in a finitely generated abelian group. So let's just summarize when the multiplicity is well behaved. So the multiplicity of z over p in m, so this is additive for p equals zero. Here m is finitely generated abelian group, of course. It's not additive, or even clearly well defined, for p equals um, 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 sorry, for, for, for P not zero. Um, it is additive for P, um, even if P is zero, for finite groups, rather obviously. So sometimes the multiplicity is additive and sometimes it isn't. And you know, you can ask when is it additive and when isn't it? And we will see later that the answer is the multiplicity is additive um, for modules such that um, the associated primes of M um, has no elements strictly smaller than R over P. I should say the multiplicity of R over P in a module. Um, so we're about to define the set of associated primes of M, which among, uh, among other things controls when the multiplicity is additive. Um, actually, um, just before defining the associated primes, I want to give an example, which is even more disturbing than the previous one. This time I'm going to take M to be the ideal in the ring of polynomials in two variables generated by X and Y. So as usual, we can just draw a picture of this ideal to keep our, um, get some idea of what's going on. So here I'm just drawing a dot for each basis element. So this is one X, X squared, Y and so on. And we can think of the, the ideal M as looking something like this, you see the, we, 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 it's got a basis of all the monomials inside this blue region. So there's a picture of M. And now we can find several decompositions of M. So we can first of all have the sequence naught goes to R, goes to M, goes to R over Y, goes to zero. And we can draw a picture of this. We can understand this by most easily by drawing a picture. And what's going on is just this. So here we've got the module M, which looks like that. And then we can take a submodule isomorphic to the ring R consisting of all these bits here. So it's just a submodule generated, free submodule generated by that element there. And then we can look at the quotient, which looks like this green area here. Um, by the way, I, this, this green area isn't a submodule, it's a quotient. It's a sort of sub-quotient of R. We're, we're, we're taking the, um, 
we're taking m and if we quotient out by this orange bit then then this green area is a quotient of m and you can see that it's actually isomorphic to r modulo y um, this is really confusing and half the time I accidentally write it down as r over x um, and this corresponds to the sequence naught equals m naught contains an m1 contained an m2 equals m where this quotient is r and this quotient here is r over y well that's fine what's the problem well the problem is we can also do things the other way round like this. So we can take naught goes to R, goes to M, goes to R over X, goes to naught. And this time, M looks like this. And R, um, we're going to take R to be a slightly different submodule of M. We're going to take it to be this one here. And R modulo X, of course, looks like this stuff that's left over, which looks like this. So now we see that R modulo Y doesn't really occur in M by looking at this sequence, and R over X doesn't really occur in M by looking at this sequence. So the only module that really occurs in M is R itself. But the trouble is we can't build M just out of copies of R. You can easily check that if we try to write naught goes to R, goes to M, goes to R, goes to zero, we just can't do this. Um, um, so we seem to be kind of stuck that, 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 that there doesn't seem to be a well-defined notion of which modules occur in M. Well, what we do is we define, we now finally come to defining the associated primes of M. So the associated primes of M is the set of prime ideals, let's put that in a big box so you notice it, um, that, um, that are annihilators of elements of M. So um, there will be plenty of ideals that maybe annihilate elements of M but aren't prime, but we don't count these as being um, elements of the associated primes of M. We can also think of this as ideals P for P prime, such that R over P is isomorphic to a submodule of M. Um, so if M is non-zero, we've seen that the associated primes is non-empty. Non, non so if M is not zero, the associated primes of M is also not empty. This is, as usual, assuming M is finitely generated and R is notarian. Informally, the associated primes of M is the set of P such that R over P is definitely occurs in um, the module M. Um, so for, uh, let, let's just see some examples of this. Um, so for example, the associated primes of Z is just the zero ideal of Z. The associated primes of Z plus Z modulo 2Z is now Z and Z and prime 2. And the associated primes of the funny module XY we had last time is just the zero prime. Um, so um, we can now ask what properties does the set of associated primes have. So suppose we've got an exact sequence, naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught. We can ask how do the associated primes of B compare with the associated primes of A and the associated primes of C? Let's ask the obvious question, is the set of associated primes of B equal to this union? The most obvious guess. 
And we answer this by using the standard counterexample to everything. Naught goes to z goes to z goes to z modulo 2z goes to naught. And here the associated primes of z is naught, the associated primes of z is naught, and the associated primes of z modulo 2z is naught. So this is definitely wrong. So what else can we do? Well, we can at least say the associated primes of A is contained in the associated primes of B. And this is completely obvious because if R over P is a submodule of A, it's obviously also a submodule of B. Slightly more subtle fact is the associated primes of B is at least contained in the associated primes of A union the associated primes of C. So although th these two aren't equal, at least one side is contained in the other. And this is easy to show. So suppose R over P is isomorphic to a submodule. Um, let's call this submodule X of B. And there are two cases. Either X intersection A is empty or x intersection A is not empty. And if x intersection A is empty, this means x is isomorphic to a submodule of C, which means that P is an associated prime of C. On the other hand, if x intersection A is non-empty, let's pick, so when I say non-empty, I mean non-zero, So let's pick A not equal zero in X with A in A. And now we notice the annihilator of this element A is equal to P. And the reason is the annihilator of any element X for X in R over P is P. And we notice that because R over P is an integral domain so the annihilator of any non-zero element is, is, the, is, is, is just zero, which would be P. So uh, in this case, P is an associated prime of uh, A. Um, so uh, th there are two uh, useful consequences of this. So here are some consequences. First of all, the set of associated primes of M is finite. As usual, M is finitely generated over a notarian ring. If you drop those conditions, there's no reason why this shouldn't be finite. And what we notice is that if we have the sequence naught equals M naught contained in M1 and so on, contained in M N equals M, then if we have mi plus 1 over mi equals r over pi, we notice um, the only associated prime is pi. And now, since um, we, we, we see that if we've got any sequence like this, then the associated primes of M must be among the associated primes of the quotients by induction. And since the quotients all have only one associated prime, we see that the associated primes of M must be contained in the set P1, P2, up to Pn, which is finite. Um, you remember we had some examples where the set of associated primes doesn't have to be equal to this set. It might be strictly smaller, but it's still finite. Um, the second property is that if we have a chain naught equals m naught contained in m1 and so on, with all the mi plus 1 over mi um, of the form r over pi, pi prime, then any element p that is an associated prime of m um, occurs in this chain. And this again follows because um, any associate, 
it's more or less what we said earlier, um, it must be one of these primes pi. So, so the set of associated primes is finite and they are primes that have to occur in any um, decomposition of m into ideas of the form r over p. So next lecture, we'll be looking at um, the, the geometric meaning of the associated primes of m and in particular, how it relates to the support of m in the spectrum of r.